I'm actually a little bit new to this field. This is a little outside of what I've done for most of my research career. So I think I can be a little unbiased when I say that what we know about nutrition and human evolution is a huge scientific success story written largely by the people you're going to hear from here today. We'd like to suggest that there is a missing piece that could be really important. And we think that that missing piece has to do with microbial contributions to host health, nutrition, and evolution. What we're mainly interested in are bacteria, including archaea, viruses, and tiny eukaryotes that are organized into microbiomes or communities of microorganisms living in close association with hosts. And when I talk about hosts, I'm going to be referring uh, really just to primates in this particular talk. Now, what is the problem that we're interested in? Um, undoubtedly, we've all been told that, uh, resist that fiber is really good for us, and that is actually true. Even though resistant fibers are good for us, our bodies actually delegate dealing with them to the gastrointestinal, or GI, microbiome. So our overall question is, how important is the GI microbiome in human evolution? Now, this slide should give us a little bit of insight into the problem that we're dealing with. Uh, food enters the intestinal tract um, here and then passes into the small intestine. Now, in the small intestine, most of the digestion that occurs is, um, is provided or is, is undertaken by enzymes that our body produces. So the nutrients that we break down and absorb at this part of the gut are largely driven by the machinery that we produce and uh, deploy in, in service of that problem. By the time that food hits the large intestine, what's left are materials that our body really can't do much with. These are primarily resistant fibers and starches. And at this point, we give it over to uh, the microbiome, to the microorganisms, primarily bacteria, that conduct metabolic functions on our uh, behalfs. We're most excited by the fact that this is where our data comes from, um, <laughs> down here. Now, uh, we think that microbiomes bring good things to life. Uh, microbes supply about 6 to 10 percent of our daily energy supply. We think this is important, and our models of human evolution and thinking about nutrition need to account for what's probably a pretty substantial uh, proportion of our daily energy supply. They also produce short-chain fatty acids. Now, these are extremely important um, energy sources. They actually supply nutrients that are directed um, directly to the intestinal lining. So the cells of the inside of our large intestine don't actually receive a blood supply. They're on the microbe's energetic ledger. So again, thinking about expensive tissues, we're actually removing these particular tissues from our budget. We're extremely interested in the fact that microbes produce hormones and vitamins. And of these, B vitamins might be very, very important, including folate, B6, and B12. And I'll touch on that just a little bit. Um, later, but these are very important vitamins in terms of brain development. They also affect obesity and appetite control. So some of the ideas that we have about fat uh, probably at this point now need to involve the microbiome, uh, gastrointestinal microbiome. This gives a brief overview of what actually happens in the large intestine. As I noted, we're presented with resistant fibers and starches. Uh, microbes uh, begin breaking this down and removing sugars from those substances and then um, conducting a fermentation uh, process here. Now that's what's most important because it produces the short-chain fatty acids. There are secondary products that find their way into being short-chain fatty acids as well, uh, as well as waste products that are produced via this process. So the host has to manage not only production of things that are very, very good for it, it has to, pro it has to process, or the microbiome has to process the waste products from this particular process. And then if everything works the way it should, those uh, substances are passed into the blood supply to assist with host energy balances. Now, why do we think that knowing about microbiomes in human evolution is important? I think we need to, uh, we would argue that uh, we really can't ignore the nutrients that derive from this source. So we know a lot about teeth, we know a lot about um, soft tissues, muscles, and so on. Um, we think it's very important to think about the nutrients that come from this process they may well add up uh, to be quite significant. They also impact many tissues, as is shown here uh, from a recent paper that draws some kind of correlate between um, what happens in the microbiome, the gut microbiome, and other tissues in the body. Experimental results are also very interesting in this regard. This is a fat mouse, in case you can't tell, and this is a not fat mouse over here. Now, the main difference between these uh, mice is that they've been implanted with the microbiome from an obese individual, I'll let you guess which one, uh, and a lean individual. 
These are sterile or notobiotic or germ-free mice that have been implanted with microbiomes from human individuals, and you can see a, a rather dramatic phenotypic uh, result from this. Anytime fat's involved, we're interested um, for many reasons, um, and uh, because it suggests something about metabolism and energy balances. The sheer scale of these interactions is also really important to us. There are trillions of microbes in us, on us, and around us at this moment, um, conducting uh, a, a range of uh, functions. So the sheer scale alone, we think, makes this interesting in the context of human evolution. Microbial products promote brain growth through the B vitamins that I talked about. They impact longevity because short-chain fatty acids are, in fact, cancer inhibitors. So there may be uh, some link here with longevity. So we are asking whether or not they have brain growth uh, roles or roles in the evolution of longevity. As we'll learn a little bit more today, some of our, our ancestors ate very, very high fiber diets. And so one question that we're very interested in is whether or not our ancestors had to negotiate new relationships um, with microbes or arrangements. There's a possibility that our microbiomes were effectively liberated, or we were liberated from our microbiomes because of the changes that occur when we cook. Finally, we might ask whether or not we were occupied by novel mi microbes that could confer different kinds of advantages to us as hosts. Uh, so what are we doing about all of this? Uh, we're conducting comparative analyses of primate gastrointestinal microbiomes, or what I'll call GI microbiomes. We're analyzing bacterial DNA from fecal samples from both wild and captive primate populations uh, to understand these microbiomes. How are we doing this? Our study breaks into two uh, major parts. The first part is taxonomy, and in essence, looking at the structure of the microbiome. What, who's there? What, how is it structured? How are the bacteria in the microbiome related to one another, and do those differ across primate species? We're taking advantage of new, um, uh, very new sequencing technologies that generate um, incredible quantities of data, and we're actually taking advantage of um, 16S uh, RNA molecule, which is very conservative in bacteria and allows us to make statements about bacterial uh, taxonomy, running it through various pipelines to get to the point of st statistics and interpretation. So the first part of our project is really taxonomic. The second part is what's called metagenomic or functional. Here we're trying to figure out what the genes that come with the microbes are actually doing. So we're saying, what's the taxonomy, what's the, what's the structure of the ecosystem, and we're asking, what does that ecosystem um, do? And again, using various sequencing technologies to get to that. What are we finding? We're finding some very interesting results with our cross-species comparison, so I'm going to give kind of a limited view of those um, here today. Uh, one thing we seem to be finding is integration between diets and microbiomes, and the example that I'm showing here uh, is from black howler monkeys or Alouatta pigra. This is an endangered species that occupies the Yucatan Peninsula. The population has been under investigation by Dr. Alejandro Estrada for many years, um, and these results were generated by uh, one of our brilliant graduate students, uh, Ms. Katie Amato. Now, it's slightly complicated, so let me uh, walk you through it. We have different habitats, including a continuous rainforest, a semi-deciduous habitat, a rainforest fragment, and captivity. And what we're finding is that rainforest monkey microbiomes harbor many more microbial species. These are the black, high, and steep lines that you see in the graph, while those in semi-deciduous forests and fragments um, do not. So what we're seeing um, are the, is the quantity of DNA that we're reading. So this is just what we can read from the DNA that's coming out of the sequencing machines. And then we're making a decision about the microbial species that are present. If you have 97% similar sequences, we put you in the same uh, bin. And what we can see is that the rainforest monkeys have many, many more microbial uh, species in their guts, whereas the, the animals that are, are in habitats that are probably not as good have many fewer microbial species in their guts. In fact, in this group, uh, all of the captive animals uh, died, and you might see why in uh, just a minute. Um, we think, therefore, that there are some very important correlations uh, between habitat quality and microbiome that might be very important in primate conservation and may give us some insights into human evolution, because we are fundamentally talking about habitat changes. Let me take another look at this. This is another view of what we were just talking about, our rainforest, our fragments, our semi-deciduous, and then our captives. We could look at this graph as kind of a map of four different cities. Each city has a number of neighborhoods in it, and these neighborhoods are composed of related uh, microbial taxa. So there's a blue 
uh, family group, if you will. There's a, there's a group of related people or microbes living in a neighborhood in each one of these cities. And you can see that in this particular city, we have lots and lots of neighborhoods. Some of these are very densely occupied, and there are close interactions among them. The lines are showing interactions among these microbial taxa. Some are more like the suburbs, where you have very sparsely occupied parts of the city where, where there's not much interaction. As habitat quality, in some ways, goes down, we can see that neighborhoods are entirely lost in the animals that are in a less desirable habitat. And by the time we start looking at the captive habitat, we can see what are probably fundamental changes to that city. Only the most densely populated um, neighborhood remains. Pretty much everything else is gone. We think this could be very important as a tool for understanding the overall health of the microbiome more generally. Let's take a, a brief look at humans in comparative perspective. And I'll go back to what we were talking about taxonomy and metagenomics here. Now, I'm oversimplifying a lot, um, but what we think we're seeing are some fairly substantial differences between human and non-human primate microbiomes. Here we're looking at something a little different. We're looking at the 50 most common bacterial phyla along the x-axis, and then we're looking at a count um, of how often they're present along the y-axis. And what you can see with the human microbiome, including infants and adults, is kind of a lazy L-shape to that curve. The first three or four bacterial phyla are present in very high abundance, and then it drops off quite, rad quite significantly thereafter, and then becomes quite, quite trivial in the case of infants. And that makes sense. Infants are born uh, uh, with, without microbiomes. They acquire them from the environment. We think that there are some important differences between the human microbiome and the non-human microbiome, and that we don't see that kind of lazy L curve to the, to the non-human primate taxa. And again, this is more complicated than I'm uh, presenting it, but it could suggest some fairly important reorganizations of human uh, microbiomes. I hope this slide isn't too complicated, but if anyone has socks that look like this, I want to photograph. This is, these are results that, that tell us about metagenome function or genome function in the microbial populations. Now, the tool that we're using um, gives us information about 28 primary functions. These are two of the functions. These are the two of the three most important um, functions that we, uh, that we can identify. So let me walk this through you. What we're saying here is that this blue howler monkey, each bar is an individual animal. The blue howler monkey is conducting uh, probably a little more than 10%, maybe 11% of the genes that we can pull out of the microbiome are dedicated to protein metabolism. When we drill down into this, what we find is that most of that is, um, is protein biosynthesis. So what we're saying is that over 10% of the genes in the microbes from non-human primates are devoted towards manufacturing protein. As you can see in humans down here, uh, it looks like less than 10% of the total genome from the microbes is involved in, in protein biosynthesis. So we think there's a difference between non-human and human primates in terms of uh, actually making uh, proteins. The pattern is um, reversed when we start looking at carbohydrates. And here again, our first blue howler, uh, and then humans, we can see that processes or genes that have something to do with carbohydrate processing are a little less common in uh, non-human primates, but they're more common in humans um, in, in this particular example. And again, we're talking about 28 uh, of general functions here. So uh, if these were allocated simply randomly, we'd be talking about 3% gene function. So there, this is a substantial portion, we think, of the microbial genome that's dedicated to um, these particular functions. So let's try to round things out um, and think about what we have. I think we're finding dynamic relations between primates and their gut microbiomes. We can't just take one gut microbiome and put it into all different primate species. There's important variation here that we need uh, to know about. And I think our howler monkeys are saying um, very clearly that this is a dynamic relation. We're actually quite worried about this from a conservation perspective because it looks like when the external habitat starts crashing, so does the internal habitat. And I want to publicly congratulate Ms. Ms. Amato for looking at this and, and having so much to worry about, not only external but internal ecosystems. We think that human microbiomes are distinct um, from those of non-human primate microbiomes. This seems to be the case taxonomically where we don't have microbiomes that are as rich and diverse as those of non-human primate species. And it looks like there are functional differences as well with the human microbiome conducting a little less protein metabolism, but more carbohydrate processing. Now, what are the implications for human evolution? 
I think we can expect that microbiomes change with diets across the course of uh, human uh, evolution. Of course, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, we can't directly get those microbes out, but it's something to think about when we talk about climate change, diet change, and so on and so forth. And the howlers may give us some guidance on that issue as well as other species that we're looking at. at. The taxonomic data seem to be showing some significant reorganization of the human microbiome. We might be thinking about a release from protein metabolism. We're asking how important our microbes for brain evolution and our large-scale comparative analyses will be addressing that. So what are some next steps? We're very interested in documenting additional covariation between microbes, habitats, and primate morphologies, particularly brain sizes. And as our comparative studies develop, we'll be able to look at that more carefully. We're extremely interested in B vitamins, and I haven't talked about those uh, very much here today, but, but we're looking closely at those, particularly in terms of the functional data that we talked about. And we're also interested in looking at protein metabolism versus, um, versus brain size in primates. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank. I'd again like to thank Ms. Uh, Amato for uh, excellent work, as well as our postdoc, Carl Yeoman, um, who has been a remarkable part of this project, as well as a number of collaborators and the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much.